I'm Rob Lukuri, a senior editor here at Gold Derby with VFX supervisor Gary Brozenich. Gary, I love how in this film, the you know the the robots, the main attraction, are treated more like actors as opposed to just random CG figures. There's a real emotion and depth in this installment of the franchise, and I really enjoyed that. How much of that is because of the work that you and your team did on the VFX for those for the robots, the, the ones that we're all dying to see? Um, I, I mean, I'd, I'd actually sort of reverse that back a bit because that really came from Stephen. Um, you know, it was his, he, he loves the franchise. He's, you know, we, we discussed all of the films in great detail and great depth, but he really wanted to treat the, uh, the robots like actors. He, he, that was his, his desire. I mean, it's built into the script. There's, uh, well, one of the first things that Lorenzo said to me when I was, uh, trying to get onto the film is he said, so what you need to understand is that there's, that the robots talk more in this film than they did in all the other films combined. And yeah. that was because Stephen just wanted to treat them like they they had they had some sort of existence outside of just grunting and, and fighting. So yeah, it, it, it stemmed from there. And I think we, we all took that to heart. And, uh, and so we spent a great deal of time casting uh, physical performers, um, actors, stunt people uh, with Stephen to, to try to make sure that they had the right character. It was more than just their walk, you know, it was more than just their gait or the way that they might fight. It was really in their personalities. So we did a, a good two or three weeks of mocap uh, with skilled performers that were all cast. We brought some of them in from different countries um, to, to really kind of uh, to, to play the part. And that created a really sound foundation. So it was, it was more based on specific characters than it was based on the hands of the animators. And that's not taking anything away from their skills or what they contributed, but uh, there was a real effort made to make them into individuals. Yeah, uh, that's cool because it, in say just under 20 years of this franchise, uh, obviously visual effects have come so far. And it's a really interesting way that this film was able to lean into that, that side of what Stephen, the director capable, was trying to achieve. Um, I think that's really interesting, it made it really compelling. Mm. Um, I think it, it also yeah. it was also born out of um, the trajectory of the franchise itself because obviously they were all the the films that <clears throat> excuse me that Michael Bay had done, which you know for me as a visual effects person just starting twenty years ago uh, was one of the reasons why I got into the industry. You know I saw I saw two things I saw Transformers one I saw Davy Jones and I thought this is where I belong, you know, so that that was inspiring for me to get to work on something like this. But after the after the the five franchise films that Bay did and they did B, you know, which swung the pendulum in a hugely different direction. Um, I think what uh, Lorenzo and the franchise and Steven were trying to do is bring it back into a place where it was still high action. It was still, you know, a lot of action and big action, you know, multiple robots fighting each other on uh, different planets and uh, different otherworldly landscapes, but also to try to keep some of the heart that B brought to Bumblebee brought to the, the franchise as well. Yeah, I, I think it kind of brings that childlike sense of joy that um, Stephen Capable was, Capable was trying to achieve out of this particular uh, installment. Um, and there's a lot of heart and humanity, which I found really interesting. Um, and I wondered then, given that you're new to the franchise, just like st the director Stephen is, um, did you have that sense of uh, something exciting and maybe even childlike? Was that something that you cared about when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, there, we, we, did, we did always have Bay there, you know, he was always a presence around the film. So if I ever had any questions or if I ever felt like I needed to uh, bounce anything off anybody you know I, I kind of had him on speed dial uh, whenever and he wrote he would always check in with me and see how things were going give some thoughts get some feedback and and that was really great and helpful but in terms of bringing a little bit of a fresh perspective to the franchise yeah I mean I think I think you know bringing some new eyes into it did help I mean we were building off the back of giants you know in, in my opinion you know there was uh there was incredible work and some of the best work done in the last 20 years have all kind of centered around this franchise. But um, I think we were able to look at it more like fans and we were able to kind of bring that perspective into it. And we just uh, thought, well, 
what what do the fans want? What are the fans like? And you know, you can't you can't fulfill everyone's dreams every time. But I think that uh, <clears throat> being able to come at it from a more kind of fan perspective uh, gave a, gave us a breath of fresh air coming into it. Yeah, I think you can tell. Um, and not taking anything away from the other installments, but in this and Bumblebee, oh. but in this one, I felt that that there was a sense of fun and 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 not fan service, but really leaning into what fans might want out of the next mm-hmm. film, this reboot from Paramount. I'm curious, um, given that this film unveils the Maximals, which anyone who watched 90s anima- the 90s animated show, um, God, I don't remember how old I was back then, but I remember watching it. Um, <coughs> it's, it's a, it, I was really excited about that, about seeing what they were going to look like. These don't transform like the Autobots do. So talk me through mm-hmm. how challenging that was to come up with that vision um, in the visual effects. Well, I mean, the, the the tricky, well, the, the trickier thing about them, as you pointed out, is that they don't go from vehicle form to biped uh, robot form. You know, they go from quadruped form, you know, animal based to, yeah. form. and, you know, it, there was a lot of discussion over a long, long time about how we reveal that, when we reveal it, do we do it earlier? Do we save it up for the, the kind of climax of the third act, um, which is where we decided to, to go with it in the end. But I think the difference is, is we had a lot of we had a lot of strange conversations, which we always do in visual effects. But it was like, what about the hair? What about the fur? You know, how does that uh, manifest itself? And and how do you try to make things look like they at least have some function or some logic to them? Uh, when you know, if you really think about it rationally, there's it's a completely illogical universe. Um, so, in terms of the trickier side of what we had to do with them versus the vehicle to uh, robot form is that there was already an understood vocabulary of the way that the cars go from you know a driving car into a walking talking robot so we've seen it before I think what we what we tried to do with that just getting a little sidetracked here what we tried to do with that that was a little bit different is that it was really important to Stephen to have like ultimate clarity about how they transformed um talking about the Autobots now yeah the it, we try to slow it down a little bit. We try to make it a little less moving parts and we try to make it feel like it was actually more naturalistic than uh, leaning heavily into pure spectacle, which is where a lot of the later Transformer franchise films went. Yeah. Same rules, but just sort of like paring it down so it felt like it could actually be happening in front of you. Uh, swinging that back to the Maximals, the Maximals were basically, you know, they're, they're jungle dwelling tree creatures that live in, in the forest. They're not, you know, hiding amongst us um, in disguise as, as vehicles. So they're, they're giant animals and making those body parts go from, you actually have a little less leeway when you go from a bipedal animal into a, a, a standing up character because yeah. the transition is actually smaller if that makes any sense. It does. So in order to get the whiz spectacle out of it that you get out of the vehicles, we had to really kind of push the movement of the way that the parts moved on those characters. And if you remember from the film, it happens when they're all on the run, they're all on the trot. Yeah. And so all of that happened in a more kind of acrobatic way. So because it only happened in one moment and because it only, you know, the fans were all kind of waiting for that moment to happen so they could actually see them in their robot form. Um, then there was a lot of pressure put on to understanding the mechanics of that. I will say this, that heavy motion and when they're at speed makes it a lot more simple to transform something uh, from one thing into another. Really? Not that you can hide things in there, yeah, but it's the momentum. You're more, you're more enthralled with the momentum and their, uh, their action. And so it sort of it balances out the need to have too much excitement in the actual transformation itself. Does that make sense? It does. So it was a yes. combination of like heavy excitement in the animation with excitement within the transformation. It's yeah, and it, it's like this organic. And when I meant they don't transform, I meant like they're not yeah. vehicles. Um, but uh, yeah, and I was really curious to see how that you were going to pull that off. And I agree. I guess when they're because they're on the run, they're running, they're moving. It is a more organic thing, and it's not like yeah, I can't exactly the words. But I hear what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a gymnast. It's a, you know if you if you're if you're following a gymnast that's doing a floor routine, that's essentially what they did when they were on the run. So yeah. because it all happened in one shot. Um, you're caught up in the in the the enthusiasm and the momentum of the shot itself too. Yeah, 
I think that made it even more exciting. It never really occurred to me, but yes, that's that's actually mm. cooler. Um, nostalgia is a big part of this film as well, uh, which I really loved because the 90s was kind of, you know, when I was growing up. And even though the Transformers themselves are, you know, they're, they're a little retro to suit the timeline. So was that also difficult to get right? Well, I, no, the, I mean, the, G, the G1 design of them was always up there, was always up front. And Sean Hallworth, who was the production designer, He'd been on, I think, four or five other Transformers films. Um, so he was a big, he was not only a big fan of the lore, but he had a big, rich history with it. So, you know, he was out there right in front of us doing the, the major designs on, on the major characters. So uh, I would say that, that Sean and Steven really led the charge on that, you know, with Hasbro and Lorenzo and, and everyone else uh, involved, because ultimately these things have to be toys, you know? So that had to be considered. I think the challenge that that brought for us was that using Optimus Prime as the example is that he's essentially a series of boxes. And uh, in his G1 design, he's got a flat front. He's got a, you know, his face is very simple and angular. His shoulders and arms are essentially just a, a kind of uh, articulated set of boxes. Yeah. And so for us to light him, and get him looking good in, in an environment is actually more challenging than something that has more curves. Like if you think of like RC, who's the, the Ducati character, that Ducati that turns into uh, the female robot and Mirage, they've got a lot more kind of compound surfaces. Yeah. So it, it receives and accepts light in a much more sympathetic way. It's also easier to make them look more dynamic. Whereas if you take a box and you shift the three degrees, then you can lose all the light on it. Yeah. So we had to come up with a lot more tricks to be able to uh, to be able to light him and and make him feel exciting, but also make him feel integrated. The integration was the easy bit. It it was the the kind of dynamism and the excitement. Yeah, that, the dynamic, yeah. Or, that they need. Word, but organic, even believable, and uh, so they were at the moment. Which brings me to this actually something that I I'm very interested when I speak to VFX supervisors like yourself is this constant challenge in your line of work and pressure. To create something photo real over and, and, and without artifice and every mm -hmm. film you do technology gets even more and more complicated <clears throat> is that always on your shoulders to make make sure things are as photo real as they can be yeah i mean that's that's on that's not only on me but that's on me and and the the rest of the team but you know but the tool sets for lighting and for creating photorealistic objects is has advanced like exponentially in the last 20 years um, to make it, I wouldn't say easier, but to make it way more accessible to do at volume. You know, it used to be that, because uh, I, I was a lighting TD uh, back in the day and the looked at TD and to get things to look um, photorealistic was a real labor of love. I mean, it was, you know, you were, you know, rolling your sleeves up, getting in there and you were fighting through every shot to make it look real. You know, we've all learned a lot of lessons over the years of, the better ways to do that. So there's a lot of attention put onto the asset, so the object at the front end. And you know, most facilities and most all large facilities really have controlled environments that they put assets through. When I say assets, I mean like whatever your whatever object it is that you're making to put into a shot. Mm -hmm. And so through the process of like, well, all of us doing tens of thousands of shots and trying to achieve the same goal. The tool sets have been refined. The, the lighting techniques have been, you know, refined to the point of, uh, of being more like photography than they are um, like a CG environment. You know, we, we talk in terms of stops when we're lighting things. We, um, we rely more on natural reflections. We build a whole in environments that will allow for physically correct reflections to take place or, you know, color bounce or lighting interactions. So, our techniques have advanced as much as the technology, I would say. Um, but in terms of like trying to advance the cause of making things look real, what's interesting to me and was always interesting to me about the Transformers franchise was yeah. watching the evolution from one to five and then into B, Bumblebee, you know, which was the six. And I'd spoke to Bay about this quite a bit, is that, you know, he he always wanted to give an enhanced version of lighting. Now, a lot of that is his natural filmmaking style as well, but the robots always had something extra. And over time, you can see the evolution of computer graphics through those films because 
we were able to do more uh, more reflections, more numbers of reflections, inter reflections, so that you know a hand would reflect onto the metal of the face. All of these things happened technically while he was making all of that franchise. So then by the end of it, he was going into a more sort of enhanced reality, which was a kind of, you know, reality plus, where he was making them ultra reflective and he was pushing the amount of light that they had on them. And uh, and we took a lot of that on board, you know, in the same way that you would light an actor on set, you know, you would have a grip chasing them around with bounce card so that you were getting light up onto their face or getting a kick in their eye. We, we, we use all the same techniques. And when you do it with something that's a giant robot like that, um, and it's a thing made out of metal, which will ultimately reflect, then you have a lot of giant bounce cars chasing around with them. It, it, it allows us to pull them off the background. It allows us to dazzle them a bit so that they look a little bit more than just real. Um, but, you know, to Steven's film, it was important to him that they felt like they were grounded. So we did that all in moderation and you know in certain scenes it was boosted in certain scenes it was brought down and uh it was all just to try to carry the audience through the experience um in the way that felt right for the film so yeah it's a mixture of reality and enhanced reality that's always. right and that word grounded is so apt for this because but, um, I don't like a lot of visual like, CGI action films that are too cartoony I just I'm out of the story but this we know that these are just toys and they're robots and it's all fun and games, but I was really invested in the story, which is okay. a lot, you know? Um, and no wonder this well, film is being touted by like various pundits who say that you know, he should be in, in the running for um, Oscar consideration. It's really, really good work. Um, Great. Thank said, you. I have a quick question before I let you go. And that is you, mm -hmm. uh, a little while ago, you were nominated for your uh, only Oscar so far uh, for The Lone Ranger. I was so happy when you got that nomination because it's not typically the kind of film that you might expect in the visual effects category, but it's so rich and dense in terms of the various shots that you were able to create. Can you take me back to that night? What's it like to be an Oscar nominee and actually attend the ceremony as a nominee? Oh, it was amazing. It was, uh, it, uh, I, I was with um, uh, Tim uh, from, Tim Alexander, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, ILM. And uh, the best thing that happened uh, was that Tim and his, uh, his wife got caught up in traffic and were late. So I got there with my wife on time and we stood up in the front with our handler. Um, and my wife just stood there while every famous person you can imagine in Hollywood walked past us. So, you know, for, for, for that experience alone, I'll always be grateful for Tim for being that little bit late. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's, it's a reward um, to be there. It's a reward to get to experience it. But I'd also say it's a it's a reward for our families because you know you always hear it in the speeches, but they they give a lot. You know the families give a lot to let all of us do our work and and you know pursue the thing that we love, and so to be able to share that uh, to give them a little bit more of the experience is, is is worth it too. So for me, even though we didn't win, all my friends that worked on Gravity did win. Yeah. So I was happy to be there to celebrate with them. Um, but also, you know, it was uh, it, it, it's nice to 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 just give your your families and partners a little bit more of an inclusion in the event, you know, Absolutely. that is your life. And you're part of the conversation. And I mean, of all films to lose to, Gravity is oh, probably up, yeah. right up there at the top. Um, <laughs> so anyway, Gabe, thank, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate the insight and um, good luck this award season. Thank you, man. It was a pleasure. Thank you.